Hi everyone, welcome back. This is the third video, ostensibly the video where I make my argument. Um, in my first video, I explained that Gilbert's account of joint commitment-based legal systems is effectively HLA Hart's view modified to ground members' demand rights against each other, as well as the state. Then, I noted that Gilbert is skeptical that any such system actually exists. In my second video, I said a bit more about Gilbert's notion of having the standing to demand and how that links up with demanding compliance with legal human rights. In this video, I turn to introduce my argument that Gilbert's own work on political obligation provides good reason to think that such commitments actually exist. This is because, I'll argue, there's good reason to think citizens frequently, though tacitly, demonstrate their readiness to commit and that these expressions of readiness are taken for granted by the population itself. These two points taken together meet the standard for population common knowledge, and that is the core of the worry that Gilbert has. So let's talk first about Gilbert's notion of how large populations form joint commitments. Her account of the formation of a joint commitment in a large population follows the same process found in her account of going for a walk together. Each party to the joint commitment must first express their readiness to commit, and then this expression of readiness must be understood as such by the other parties involved. Despite the anonymity of most members of state-sized populations to each other, Gilbert maintains across her work that joint commitment can occur on such a large scale, though the same condition of common knowledge must obtain. The members of the population in question must each express their readiness to bind themselves up with each other with respect to the content of their prospective commitment, whether this be a commitment to pursue a goal, hold a belief, uphold a rule of recognition, or some heterogeneous combination of the like. In the case of going for a walk together, as I note above, this process passes by nearly unnoticed. In larger populations, however, the mechanics of joint commitment formation require a closer examination. First, I comment on members' expression of readiness to commit. Then, I discuss the development of population common knowledge regarding other members' readiness. In each case, I'm going to draw predominantly on Gilbert's comments in her book, Political Obligation. So the first complication for joint commitment in large populations is that the members of such a population must have, at least to meet Gilbert's standard, a conception of their population in order that their expression of readiness be about the prospective plural subject, that is their population. Each member requires a minimal sense of what constitutes membership in such a population. But given Gilbert's examples, people living on this island, those gathered in the town square tonight, those who live east of the mountain, a minimally restrictive, po uh, a minimally restrictive folk conception of the membership criteria is sufficient. A concept of the inclusivity of one society need not even be shared in specific terms. Sufficient common knowledge for the creation of a joint commitment need only generally reference the population, i.e. members need not have worked out a robust sense of Canada, but need only have some notion of there being some people who are Canadians, of which they are one. In this respect, commitments are often formed in large populations with fuzzy conceptual boundaries. In her essay, A Real Unity of Them All, Gilbert provides a useful example of how public common knowledge might be bootstrapped. In her example, a politician begins their speech with the phrase, we the people of Europe endorse this goal, though no such people of Europe yet endorses that goal. In this respect, the politician's comment is false. Perhaps there are people which live in a geographic area of the European continent, but this population does not at the moment of the speech yet jointly commit to the goal in question in a way that could ground the politician's use of we. In such a case, it's possible that following the politician's speech, residents of the relevant area begin to conceive of themselves as members of Europe. But until that time, the politician's statement regarding the people of Europe is effectively a bet 
in two parts. First, that those listening will accept the statement in question, and that this acceptance will trickle out into the population of the European continent, leading to the eventual endorsement the politician purports. Second, that no one will challenge the politician on the grounds for their claim to speak on behalf of the population in question. Gilbert suggests how the former might play out. In addition to the politician in question, other members of parliament will also make what would be false pronouncements about the people of Europe accepting or rejecting such a goal, which through a process of considerably, through a process considerably extended in time and through mechanisms like news reports, hearsay and other media, members of that prospective joint commitment, that is the people of Europe, will either come to express their willingness to go along with it or will reject it. Regardless of their ultimate commitment, a conception of the population as forming a political society must be introduced either intentionally or accidentally. You may have trouble with this, uh, with this example because it seems to presuppose that if, if there's a parliament, you know, Europe as a society already exists in a political sense, things like this. Uh, I, we can talk about that in the Q&A. It's not a perfect example, but it's the core one that Gilbert uses. Gilbert provides a similar example when explaining how a joint commitment-based legal system might develop. An individual might express her readiness to commit by rebuking another citizen for nonconformity, saying, it's against the law. This organic reference to the law suggests her readiness to uphold the rule of recognition for that given population as a body, with the person they're rebuking, and also with other people of their community. Gilbert adds that when interactions are, as an empirical matter, widespread throughout a population, that concludes the formation of the joint commitment. So it's an empirical matter as to whether the joint commitment obtains or not, even though I'm gonna say, I think we have good reason to think empirically it's already obtained. Unlike in the cases of two people expressing their readiness to go for a walk together, the anonymous and geographically disparate members that comprise the population of a state must first come to identify themselves as members of such a population and conceive of others who meet the relevant membership criteria conceiving of themselves in the same way. That is, the participants need an account of the prospective collective in order to express their readiness to participate in joint activity with other people who also think of themselves as prospective members. Unlike a geographic social kind, like people within a territory or people in a crowd, the conception of collectivity and the inclusivity of the relevant we in this case will bear on how members and prospective members interpret other, member, other people's behavior as an expression of readiness to join together. So, as in the case of the politician's suggestion of a we, the social group the politician posits in their speech will come to exist through the we attitudes of the individual members of the population in question. The more significant question, however, is how one has a we attitude about the, popu about the population and how they come to recognize the readiness of others. So given members' understanding of the population in question as a potential we, that is, a we the people, or we don't do that around here, their expressions of readiness take a more general form than the directed expressions of smaller cases, like walking together. A person within a large population like a state must have a population concept and also express their readiness to other members of the same population with a generalized reference to the population as a whole rather than to particular members. That is, they have to express that they're ready to commit with them and relevant other people insofar as each of them fits a general description that the population concept provides. It's that generalized form of readiness to commit along with all the other members of the population as a whole, and 
population common knowledge of the same that provides sufficient ground for members who have no personal relationship to each other other than membership in the relevant joint commitment to become jointly committed and thereby to acquire the standing to intervene in each other's activities. In the case of state officials, members of the state in question where there exists legal human rights of the form I note above, will have the standing to intervene in such officials' activities despite their relative anonymity to each other. As I've also noted, readiness expressing behavior might be implicit and take the form of a rebuke which presumes such standing, or it might act in the way that the speech at the European Parliament does. I'm now gonna suggest other implicit expressions of readiness that might also include pressure to follow social conventions and also reactions to that pressure. Further to Gilbert's criteria of how a joint commitment is constituted in a large population, prospective members form a joint commitment, I wanna say, when each intentionally expresses their readiness to commit and each other member identifies that behavior as such. But also, it need not be intentionally expressed. The minimal requirement of Gilbert's notion of readiness is that it be expressed at all, regardless of the intent. Members will imply readiness to commit to a joint activity just by following social convention and other members of that population have reason to take that behavior with respect to social convention to express the same. That is, when people play their part, we have reason to think that they're playing their part in a process. In such cases, which in a Bradley Anonymous society, I wanna say are quite common, members express readiness to commit to joint activity through behavior that becomes meaning meaningful against background conditions, rather than just by explicit expression, like saying to someone, let's go for a walk. This isn't to say that explicit commitments don't count. It's to say that in addition to explicit commitments or explicitly enforcing a norm or making direct reference to a system in a speech, implicit acceptance and tacit acceptance also constitute expressions of readiness. These cases form a spectrum of expression from explicit identification of readiness in direct speech to nonverbal implicit expressions of readiness to commit, all of which involve each participant's common knowledge of behavior that would count as expressing readiness. The common knowledge required for joint activity thus also requires both knowledge of readiness expressing behavior and the identification of other people's behavior as such, both of which, I want to say, occur frequently through nonverbal and indirect behavior. So I want, and here are my suggestions. I'm going to give two suggestions for how that happens and why we should think it happens frequently. The common knowledge requirement, as I've said, involves relevant joint commitment content being, as Gilbert puts it, out in the open, in the sense that it has to be sufficiently pub public for all members of the population to perceive it themselves and to conceive of all other members of the population perceiving it. Achieving sufficiently public content of the commitment requires that members of the population demonstrate their readiness to commit in ways that they and relevant possible members of the joint commitment can reasonably perceive. And I think on reflection, this is quite common with respect especially to legal systems. As I've said, Gilbert allows a fairly flexible account of the development of shared commitment content through a simple and intuitive model people are likely to demonstrate their readiness to commit to the broad-based joint commitments of large populations when they're in environments that are conducive to their socialization into collective values that are found in that population. I wanna suggest that where a person is socialized to take the authority of law 
and its sources as reasons for action and reasons for constraint. That person demonstrates their readiness to commit to upholding the rule in their day-to-day -day socially normative behavior with respect to the legal apparatus of the state. In those cases, people don't need to explicitly consent to their commitment, but they're likely to do so regardless due to the normative pressures of the surrounding social environment. This can come from psychological pressure to go along with the views and behaviors of parents. And people are likely to go along with values received early on through school teachers and others in positions of authority. If they don't, they'll be met with rebukes or punishment. In those instances, the normative social pressures surrounding the values found in one's environment are likely to lead one to tacitly express readiness to jointly commit in the relevant sense. That is, jointly commit to the shared values, including the value of the rule of law. This is in addition to one's behaving to follow social conventions that put those values into action, whether one actually agrees with the values at hand or not. And Gilbert admits that joint commitments are ubiquitous, but it seems also that behaviors which fit Gilbert's notion of readiness to participate in a joint commitment are tied very frequently to recognizing the authority of law, both in a widespread sense and when it's socially enforced. Another form of, of implicit expressions of readiness is the tacit acceptance of the commitment content, that is the rule of recognition, through norm enforcement behavior. In these cases, and Gilbert has a comment on this, in these cases, after regularly engaging in the practice for whatever reason, people will begin to behave in ways appropriate to those who are jointly committed to sustain the practice demanding conformity of one another and rebuking people who fail to conform, regardless of the size of the population in question. So they need not do this for the right reasons to express their readiness to commit to the rule of recognition. It's in this respect that collective norm enforcing behaviors get off the ground as proto joint commitments. When someone enforces the norm, they demonstrate their readiness to commit as with value-based norm enforcement, general norm enforcement behaviors related to social practices of a particular population are sufficiently about that population insofar as they're about the social milieu where it happens to express readiness to commit to norms in question without explicit intention. Given this model, when we find citizens of a state behaving in ways which are identifiably normative, or norm following, I should say, with respect to the legal system itself, those citizens can reasonably take that behavior to show others readiness to uphold a joint commitment to recognize the validity of the legal system itself in their population. Where such a society exists, citizens will accrue the special standing to demand compliance with the state's laws that we have been discussing, inclusive of that state's human rights legislation. In short, people who are socialized to recognize the authority of law have the right kind of value to become joint, to express their readiness to jointly commit to upholding the rule of recognition in their population. And people, regardless of what their values are, who act in accordance with legal norms, demonstrate sufficient readiness to commit that they also constitute prospective members of a joint commitment in the relevant sense. Add these to people who more directly express their readiness and also people who enforce norms related to the law, like the person rebuking another who says, it's the law. On this view, there's quite a lot of people, and it's quite common that people express readiness and understand that all of the other people that they encounter in their day-to-day -day life express readiness in the relevant sense to constitute a joint commitment. 
This conclusion treats Gilbert's worry about the rarity of individuals' actual demand rights against states which violate their human rights. Because I suspect many citizens do find members of their state population upholding the rule of law in their day-to-day -day life, and that they do so as well. Those citizens, at least given Gilbert's view, have reason to conclude that they live in a society wherein their membership of the, in that population is constitutive of their standing to demand others comply with the state's legal framework, including agents of the state itself. In fact, even where a person is critical of laws or the legal system itself, they're likely to maintain a comportment both personally and outwardly in their behavior that treats the law as existing in an adequate way to meet the readiness requirement. That's all I have time to discuss for now, but I'm, I hope that we can talk more about this in the Q&A and hopefully because I haven't had the ability to use slides, the handout that I'm hoping to put up will be useful. Um, do let me know if you have any questions. Thanks very much for listening.